The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Woodland Stud, Brecon Farms, New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, Stonewall Stud, The Clubs, Alexandra Park, Cambridge, Addington and Ashburton, Garrard's Horse and Hound, and IRT. It's your horse and our passion. Hi everyone, welcome into your box seat on the eve of the Auckland Cup. Of course, when you're watching this, the race is about to happen tonight. The Woodlands Auckland Cup for 200,000. Michael Guerin, it's nice to be back in the studio with you. And I guess it's nice for us to be heading to Alexandra Park as well, because maybe seven or eight months ago, this might not have been possible. Yeah, hi Greg. Nice to have you back in Auckland. Hi everybody. I hope you're enjoying the holiday period. It's Cup Day at Alexandra Park on Thursday. And Look, I think it's a celebration of the fact we've got this far. We, we all know 2020 has had its enormous challenges, not so much in New Zealand as other countries, but the last time we were in the studio doing the show was March the 18th, Gregory. That's before a lockdown even seemed possible. It was some crazy thing that could maybe one day happen. During that period, there was enormous challenges for New Zealand racing. We all know that. They have weathered that storm. Turnovers have been good in the last six months. There were enormous challenges for Alexandra Park uh, around the apartment buildings and how it didn't go well and the financing for those. And, and Mario Barsi and his team have weathered that storm. And now we've got to a really good meeting on Thursday night and, and something to celebrate and hopefully turn the page. So it's great it's it's fallen together the way it has Gregory. A lot of people watching the show have sacrificed, they've worked hard, they've they've done things they haven't had to do before. Um, and all of that's happening to the point, Greg, where we almost haven't had too much time to think about what else is happening on Thursday night. And that is the end of an absolute era for harness racing. Natalie Rasmussen's gonna join us shortly as the All Stars tomorrow no longer exist. <laughs> that's one of the weirdest things in harness racing to end 2020, so it's a remarkable time. Group. Yeah, it certainly has been, uh, Michael, and looking forward to talking to Natalie shortly. Of course, the Woodlands Auckland Cup for $200,000 and the market, well, it shapes up like this with Spankham, the favourite, at $2.40. He's come up with a beautiful barrier draw for him. He generally steps quickly. He should be able to find himself in the top few early on, Michael, and that makes him the horse to beat. You got the news out of the race yesterday. Of course, check-in is out. Doesn't affect the barrier draws too much, apart from the fact that the fixer goes to two on the second line. So triple weight the outside of the front line. If you're watching this and you don't follow a lot of two-mile races at Alexandra Park, because there aren't many, Ashley Loke has one on the second line. The only market moves here is basically a swap. Amazing Dream has gone out, 40 cents, copy that's come in, 50 cents, that pids them each of two at 3.9. Amazing Dream, Gregory, I'm absolutely convinced, will continue to go out and copy that might eke in just a bit more. But Spankham's 2.4, if he's still 2.4 when you're watching this on Thursday, I would take that. I think he'll start close to $1.90, top Top price for him, I believe, will be $2. OK, well, an opportunity for us, Michael, to have a chat now to co-trainer and driver of Spankham in Natalie Rasmussen. Uh, Natalie, thanks so much for your time. Uh, Michael mentioned before it's the end of an era in so many ways. Um, does it feel any different building into a premier meeting for you and Mark? Oh, no, just, probably Greg, I'm just glad for the last one. Yeah, well, you'll be looking forward to the big one, the Auckland Cup. You guys have won the last five in a row and you have a strong hand once again with your drive Spankham being the dominant favourite. And we'll have a look at his Franklin Cup win shortly, Natalie. How's he come through that and how happy are you with him? Oh, really happy with him, Greg. Um, couldn't actually be happier. Like, he's just training and has been super. Um, yeah, he just seems very well within himself. He's got a really nice draw there, sort of just in the middle of the pack there. Um, yeah, I honestly just couldn't be happier with him. He gets to the outside here of the fixer, who, of course, was second last year behind uh, Self Assured, and he really savaged the line. He appears to enjoy Alexandra Park as much as he enjoys left-handed, but it doesn't seem to matter to him at all, does it? No, no, I actually, if anything, I'd probably say he's probably that little bit better right-handed spank. Um, you know, he doesn't hang quite as much. Um, but no, I, I just, I think he's he's in a great place. And, you know, I, I just, like I said, I just couldn't be happier. He's come up with a beautiful barrier draw. His manners at the start are generally very good. Um, there's not many negatives there, is there? No, there's not, Greg. No, I think the, the draw is nice. You're just sort of in the middle there. Um, you don't have to be brilliant away, but you don't have, you know, not, not slow, and you just sort of should lob a nice enough spot. Um, I, I think, 
just with the way that the field is, not that probably, I think there'll be a bit of speed coming out the widest. Um, some of them are quite quick. So yeah, it'll be quite an interesting, interesting first lap, I think. Natalie, the one question mark you had going into the New Zealand Cup was the two miles. Is two miles different at Alexandra Park than, say, to Addington Raceway, particularly if you're in front on the markers? Look, I, I would say, I know it sounds silly, but I'd probably say yes, Greg, to a degree. Um, and, and I think just depending on the trip you get, and I'm sure Spanx is a, a bit fitter horse now too, a little bit harder, that little bit fitter again. Um, so, look, I'd be very surprised if he doesn't, you know, see, see it out. I know it's not his favourite distance, like he's such a high-speed horse, um, but, you know, he did nothing wrong in the in the New Zealand Cup at, at um, Addington, made his own luck. He had a horrible draw and was a long, long way back and, you know, had to loop the field um, and do a power of work. So, you know, I just I, I just think whatever he did in the Cup, in the Cup, um, he should be better for this one. Now, it looks a race where if you're able to lead there shouldn't be too many attackers. Is that where you want to be? And do you believe you can get away quicker than copy that, who would seem to be the only horse in the front line who maybe would park you out? Um, look, I, depending, I suppose, on what sort of a start is on, usually at Alexandra Park, they don't walk around, you sort of basically walk in and go. Um, I think copy that spank probably got very similar speed, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, like I said, some of the employers from out wide actually got across both of us. So it'll just be a little bit tactical early, probably a bit of cat and mouse, I guess. Um, and, I mean, if Spanky does get away on the right foot, he is actually quite fast. So, yeah, just I, I think it'll just be very, very interesting, that first 100. Ned. Amazing Dream has been the second favourite. She might start third favourite. Are you sort of surprised, not because of her ability, but she doesn't have a lot of form in open class and she hasn't been winning the mares races or winning them easily when she has won. Does she deserve to be a second favourite in this race or do you think that Ashley Lokaz or The Fixer or Copy That is at least as good or as proven as her? Well, most definitely. Look, them, them guys you just mentioned, um, your low has copy that, um, the fixer, they've all been there, they've done that, they've proven that they're up to it. Look, she's the new kid on the block. Um, look, it wouldn't at all surprise me to see her come out and win, by any means. It would not surprise me one bit. Um, but she needs to take that step. And, you know, like for the punters out there, we haven't seen that yet and we don't really know. But um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if she actually begins very quick. Um, she just strikes me as that sort of horse and all the times I've ever driven her. Um, even on our straight track at home when you're standing and then you go, um, she musters up speed really quick. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see her lob a real great spot. Um, but I don't believe she should be shorter probably than, than you copy that. So I think Ashley Lokaz is a forgotten horse. Um, I thought his run uh, a fortnight ago was probably the run of the race when he sat part um, and he just went down by a metre or so, so I really thought he, and he'll be fitter and better for it. Um, and he'll love the distance as well. So I, I think he's probably the forgotten horse of the field. Nat, just to clarify this for punters watching around New Zealand and people back in your home country in Australia, is Spankham your clear top pick and top chance for the All-Stars? Yes. Thank you. That All right, easy. that was pretty <laughs> frank and, and to the point, Natalie, which we've come to expect over the last uh, decade or so from your stable. Let's talk about some of the other runners, the boys going to the Harness Million. How pleased are you with them? Um, look, I think he's class. Look, we're pleased with him, but he's just had that bugger of a trip since he's been up here. Um, the first one, he, he jumped something as the mobile left, so he didn't really have a race. Uh, then the next start he was going to have, he got sick, so he had to be withdrawn. So he's probably just going to lack that little bit of race hardness and fitness. Um, it's only that he's fit and ready, but he's just going to lack that. There's nothing like race race fitness. Um, I think Tyson Pride, I was very disappointed with him last start. When he ran full, I thought it was a poor, poor effort. Um, but I think he's, he's a better horse than that, and, and I was very pleased with him in the race on Cup Day when he ran home nice for fourth or fifth or wherever he ran. Um, if he can sort of just return, regain that form, I wouldn't at all be surprised to see him up in the firing line. Um, I think Aladdin will go a good race, but he's probably one of them guys who just has to maybe capitalise on a little bit of luck. I've uh, been saying that he did sit parked on Cup Day and, and run a nice third. Um, and then you've got probably Shan Noble, who's the big improver of the whole lot of them, and it's probably just a bit shame where he drew. If he had drawn maybe where any of the other three had drawn, I would have just said, I would have thought he was near a good thing. All right. Well, he was outstanding, of course, uh, or has been in his two runs up north sitting parked. Uh, a couple of your other runners I want to touch on. Last start, uh, Group 1 winner, of course, uh, beyond uh, words. How's she progressing towards uh, the race this week? 
Oh, she's fantastic. Um, she's just going from strength to strength, that girl. Um, look, we don't have too many unrest four-year-olds in the camp, so, you know, she, she didn't start for us until she was four, so that, you know, says something about what we thought of her ability. Um, and since the trip away, you know, she's really tightened up and packed up and got a lot fitter. She was always a real big girl carrying a fair bit of weight, um, but she just looks an absolute picture, and I think she's just... A really, really nice mare. All right, they put up a dollar thirty-five for her. I'm sure she'll be through a lot of multis to the size stakes final. Where better twist is a dollar forty favourite. Uh, she's just been so brave, Natalie. She deserves that spot, doesn't she? Oh, she does, Greg. But I think La Rosa, you know, she put up a great fight last start, and she's drawn under better twist again this week. So, you know, I wouldn't be discounting her. And I, I mean, she's having a second run at the park, La Rosa. So she'll be, I'm sure, she'll benefit from having that first start there. Um, but in saying that better twist, you know, she never lays down. Her training's been excellent. Uh, I've actually worked on myself up here. Um, I just feel that she's in a really good place. She's just a real great attitude. She wants to win. Uh, and I don't think she's short of speed either. I think it's a bit of a, a myth that she's just a stayer. But I, I, I wouldn't mind sitting back in the field. I'm going to get one run at <laughs> No, and darling me, she's done a nice job, but not quite as good as those other two. And what's your secret gave Mark a bit of a hairy ride in his last week officially as a trainer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, she's always been a little cagey little thing. Um, she's got a bit of sass about it. But um, no, she, she's, in a little cage. she's in a world of bother from the draw. Um, probably just be looking for shortcuts with her. Yeah, and Revered's in race number two. He probably needs to lift a wee bit. Oh, he does. Because look, Mark's been just wrapped with his training. Um, and he's done the heap of one-on-one -on -one with him. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me to see him just come out and, and go a, a great race like he, he did on Cup Day. Like, his winning Cup Day was amazing. Um, and I just wouldn't be surprised to see him get back to that form. But then again, you know, he hasn't paced that good right-handed here. So he'd, he'd want to, you know, put it all together. But in saying that, Mark has been really happy with his, with his work. All right, Ned. Tomorrow morning, uh, when you wake up, it'll be 2021. It'll be nice to turn the page. But you won't officially be training as of tomorrow. I know you and Mark are taking a few days away in Nelson and then some horses are heading to Australia. What happens for you next? I know Mark intends on driving through. Are we expecting to see you drive very often? Are we expecting to see you at the races very often? How often do you see yourself going to the stables? Or is all this very flexible when you'll sort of make it up as you go along? Well, we have sort of made the commitment to Hayden that leading up to premier meetings um, and your, your, your jewels and all your big stuff like that, that we would be there hands on in the barn helping him out hobble days um, where we, you know, just drive, you know, most of the, the main team just to, to make sure they're where, where we need them or where he need them. Um, so we have made that commitment. So we'll still do that. Um, but in saying that, as far as the racing goes, just not really too sure. Uh, I'm probably, personally, I'm not too keen, but if, you know, there was, say, a nice one, you had a double up, maybe Amazing Dream, Beyond Words, lining up against each other and you need the driver, you know, you might put the hand up. But, um, look, I'm really not too fussed either way, Mick. I'll just wait and see how it goes. Uh, I think I've sort of, you know, I've had a really good run. I've been lucky enough to drive some great horses and, and I just think now it's sort of time maybe to give the kids a bit of a go. OK, just discussing that, Ned, is that something you see, and again, nobody knows what's going to happen, 2020 proved that to us, as this being a year sabbatical, that's the word I'm tending to use for this, or are you quite happy to say to yourself, you may never train again and you may never drive in major races regularly again? Is that something you're quite comfortable with or are you thinking more, hey, I need a really good break and then I might come back to this? Um, Mick, it's probably more one of the things, we'll just see how we go. Um, that's why we did want to retain the property um, and just... We've, we've just leased it for the, for the start for 12 months to Hayden. Um, but if, if Mark and I do resume training on any level, there'll be nothing like the scale that we've done um, or the way it has been. It might just be put around with a couple of our own, maybe four or five or something like that. Um, but in saying that, we may never want to do it again. We might be really just happy just watching them at home and, and you know, helping Hayden out here and there. It's just I don't think people realise um, I'm coming up in here 10 years and just the amount of... Uh, just it, when you're trying to be everywhere and do everything, it's not as if you're just running the business or just race driving or just training. You're running a multi-million dollar business, plus you're managing a lot of staff, plus you're racing horses. And, and at times we've had horses in um, Victoria, New South Wales, Auckland, Christchurch, and the logistics of it all and just getting it all coordinated. And I always did that. So I just, I feel really, personally, I feel just really burnt out and tired and I just want to get away from it for a bit.
Nat, I can, I can fully respect that, and I, I hope you have a nice break. I've got one more question for you, Natalie, and please, uh, we thank you for coming on to explain this to us, and we know this is very much a movable feast. What about the yearling sales? They are just around the corner, about six weeks away, a Karaka and then down in Christchurch. Do you see yourself and Mark going to buy horses there for yourselves? Are you open to buying horses for other people? Are you going to be buying for people who may be owners for Hayden? Because obviously you've had a big impact at the sales in the last 10 years. Does that continue? Um, well, it did, because when we actually rang around and notified all our owners of what we're doing, the main question we got from all of them was, you know, will we still be looking at yearlings for, for the owners? Um, and we discussed that with Hayden, and um, if, if people want Mark and myself to, to go, you know, we, we thought we'd have a bit more time pre-sale this year, so we're actually going to stay up after the Cambridge meeting on the 8th and do brick and farms and hopefully woodlands and do a lot of the North Island after the 8th and get a lot of those covered pre-sale um, and then we'll do the same down the South Island because if Mark has to go to Australia, um, we'd really like to cover as many as we can before he goes So and that would probably just then leave me here come sale time. So, um, yeah, but no, definitely 100% we, we said that we, we would do that and, and that we've had a lot of um, interest actually with the owners still happy to support Hayden and buy yearlings. Natalie, thanks so much for coming on the show. We've appreciated your uh, frankness and your openness uh, over that decade that you just talked about there. And to you and Mark, we wish you all the best for the last uh, big dance, if you like. And I know Self Assured won't be there, but he will be at Cambridge and there's still plenty to look forward to with him. He's come through everything fine. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah, I actually hobbled him this morning. He, he's in a great place. Um, yeah, we did actually nominate him, but um, the powers to be thought he was too good to be there on a premier meeting in a normal race, so he was taken out of that field. Um, I sort of understand a little bit where they come from there, but it is a premier meeting, and I, I like to think that you'd have your best horses there. Um, but I think that's just what our racing sort of come to a little bit. Um, it just caters up for mine a lot of mediocrity. Yep, that was disappointing not to have him there, but we really appreciate you coming on. All the very best, Natalie. No worries at all. Thanks heaps, guys. All right, that's Natalie Rasmussen, and she's always been so honest and upfront and frank, and when you asked her if Spankham was clearly their best chance, Michael, we got that answer pretty straight away, pretty yeah, straightforward. Yeah, I'm going to miss having Natalie around harness racing because there's no bullshit involved, and there's an incredible level of talent there. Mark is a very nice person, and he can be very nice, and Nat has a bit more bitch in her, which I like. It, it's very to the point. And I think that's been a real strength for them, as it is for a lot of couples. You need someone who's nicer and you need someone who's a bit harder. <laughs> um, it's a massive, massive deal what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. It's quite hard for you to get your head around. I think if you're a galloping person watching this show and they said tomorrow morning there's no Chris Waller, he just going on holiday, or there's no Jamie Richards, it's a big deal. Mm. And it's got to shake markets. And we have no idea how the, the team's going to go for Hayden. He's a talented young horseman. He'll have a lot of success. But it's a really intriguing time, Greg. It's uh, alongside a couple of the, the issues we've had 15 years ago, and, and luckily Harness Racing haven't had any really major on-track issues for quite a while. This is the most interesting thing that's happened in Harness Racing because there's going to be a gap there where somebody can say, well, I'm going to buy more yearlings and step into that forward. And the Robert John Dunn stable is clearly going to be the leading Crandall stable. Crandell Giddy, who we spoke to last yeah, week. Exactly, and there's a, uh, maybe a young guy like Josh Dickey. There's, there's room there for people Regan to move. Regan Todd. You know, because, these, yeah. well, well, for a lot of people, Greg, for a trainer like Josh Dickey, in the 10 years he's been training, there's never been a time he was taking horses to group one pacing races and thinking, I can win these. Everybody, everybody on both sides of the Tasman, the leading trainers in Australia ring me and say, what are Mark and Nat bringing for the Derby? What are Mark and Nat bringing for the Oaks? What are Mark and Nat bringing for the Miracle Mile? Now that conversation stops. Hmm. That's going to be really interesting. Interesting point Mark said to me this week for a story in the Herald. When these horses, self-assured and spank them, are likely to go to Australia, they'll be going in Hayden's name. Yes. Now Mark will be training those horses, but they'll still be going in Hayden's name. It's going to be a very odd experience for people to go to the races next week at Cambridge and see self-assured lining up in the flying mile with H. Cullen next to it. Yep. To Hayden, we wish you the best of luck. If you Absolutely. ever need any advice or you want to give anybody a call, there's a whole bunch of people around you who are going to support you. But uh, I, this happens so rarely in the world of racing. It's incredibly rare. In either code, the top champion trainers walk away. Yep. It never happens. No. So this is a, a pretty unusual it's the, it's thing we're going through. The old cliche or the, the old adage that going out on top going out when you're at the top of your game. 
You know them both very well. You live around the corner from Mark and Nat. You know them probably better than I do. What do you think will happen? Well, I know Natalie's definitely not going to Australia, so there'll be none of that. She's not going over there in terms of driving the horses, so that's the end of that. COVID has played a part in that, but... Um, well, they can't both go because of the quarantine. Um, so I, I don't think this is a, a year sabbatical for her. I think this might be the end of the training. She may well, very well drive a little bit, but no. And I believe training a couple of their own horses long term, I think that's more realistic. They might have a team of 10 or 12 that they, mm. they do themselves, but that's a little bit further down the track. We need to concentrate on the Cup, the Woodlands... Auckland Cup, 200,000. First run in 1890. Michael, Michael, here's the market again. 240 about Spankham. I know he's your top tip. Um, Amazing Dreams never started from a stand. Natalie seems to think if she does step, she may well step very quickly. I think both of those potentially will step quicker than copy that. What about further out? Who are the quick beginners there? Nothing really. There's no flyer, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, Greg. Standing starts are so hard to predict in this country. We saw the New Zealand Cup. We saw the debacle. It's just... I've given up almost trying to predict what's going to happen in standing starts. I, I think this race comes down to almost one thing. Who lands in spank front Spank them first. and copy that, who lands in front. Because yep. if Amazing Dream lands in front, she'll hand to spank them. There's yep. absolutely no doubts. Zero doubts. So then spank him's in front and it's his race to lose. If copy that lands in front, he won't hand. Anything else on that front line will hand to spank him. Yep. yep. So spank him, I reckon, is about 60 to 65% to be in front of this cup with two laps to go, unless Copy That gets there first. And if Copy That gets there, the dynamic of the race changes. I understand the love for Amazing Dream in the market. I'm not saying she can't win. But in my mind, the market, spank him $2, Copy That $3, Amazing Dream 6 and make your way out from there. Right. I just think it comes down. I said the exactly same thing before the New Zealand Trotting Cup. I said, whoever had a self assured to Copy That leads first will win. Yep. And this is exactly the same thing with Spankham in play for the copy that role. I'm going Spankham on top because I think he's a better chance to get in front and I also think that if Amazing Dream led, she would hand up to him. All right, so that's the Woodlands Auckland Cup, a great race I'm sure it will be. Also, a great race will be the National Trump, Michael Guerin, because uh, the battle we saw unfold at Cambridge was everything we'd hoped it would be and this could even be better. Sunday Sun shortened from twos into $1.85. 260 for Bolt for Brilliance. He'll definitely be improved a majestic man who was fantastic in the flying mile on Christmas Eve. 450 out to five dollars. Let's go back and have a look at that performance, Michael. He is clearly for mine the king over the short course. Majestic man. Now he's won a flying mile at Ashburton in 54, and he won this very easily. He did. He was very good, and, and Cambridge sets up beautifully for a horse like him. I actually don't think Sunday Sun was at his peak for this race. I think his white blood cell count was up, wasn't a big deal, but I think he raced about 5% below his best. Uh, I think Bolt for Brilliance was out of play five yards after the start. Once Tricky Rick got into the spot in front of Bolt for Brilliance and he wasn't on the back of Sunday Sun, that completely changed everything. Here's that gate speed. We're going to see this. We know it's going to happen later on tonight. What's going to happen is he'll cross to the lead. The question is this. Does John Dunn want to get involved early and push up and get him behind him? This might be a rarity for Sunday's son. Let's not forget, he led off the gate in the jewels. I can see him getting across in front of the rest of them. Can and you? Actually okay. sitting, well, there's no horse there who's got superior gate speed to him, apart from Majestic Man. I can see him being on Majestic Man's back. And Majestic Man, the speed he rolls along at is so consistently high that I can see Sunday Sun having the gap to pull out whenever he likes. I think they'll probably lead in trail, unless he goes rough out of the gate, which I don't think You he don't will. think Tony will come out hard with Bolt for Brilliance and try and get the back? I've just got a theory around Sunday Sun. I know he hasn't galloped outside of Kaikoura when it wasn't his fault for a long time, but it's still there. And if you bust him early and he galloped, I, I don't think... Don't get, I agree with you, but I don't think it needs to bust him. I literally think he'll just fall into the lead. Mm. Because Majestic Man will be so quick across. All he has to do is cross the horse and Just remember him. when Cracker Hill and Bolt for Brilliance came out earlier in yep. December, Tony came out really hard and made sure he got to the trail. I reckon he might try that again. I, I, okay, he could. I, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think it'll be negative at the start from those two as it was last week at Cambridge. I think Majestic Man leads and then I think there'll be a bit more horseplay inside them because what John Dunn doesn't want 
is to be sitting parked outside Majestic Man, knowing he can break it with bolt for brilliance on your back. Here's the last time they went to Alexandra Park and they tried that game. Majestic Man Leti, this is over 2,200. And that's Sunday Sun sitting parked outside him and beating him comfortably. Now, in your mind's eye, put bolt for brilliance on the back of Sunday Sun here. And that's what you don't want if you're John Because he's got the speed. He's got the it's superior exactly. speed, I believe. So... I think Sunday Sun might try and get to the marker pegs as quickly as possible. I don't think it's impossible he can do that, and then he may get an easier run. Either way, I think he's the horse to beat because he's going to settle in front of Bolt for Brilliance 70 or 80 percent likely. But you, I agree with you. There's the chance Tony Hurley he could get a fly at him off the, off the, um, at the start. I'm not sure I take a dollar 85 about Sunday Sun, but I think he's clear top pick in the race. I think a lot of people are. Bizarrely, not going to affect the Majestic Man as a chance. Yeah, but I spoke to Phil Williamson and he, he said to me, I could not be happy with him. He said he will need to be at his peak, which he is, and the other two would have to be slightly down. In his opinion, he said, I'm not knocking my own horse, but they are superior horses. Their record suggests that, and although Bolt for Brilliance doesn't have that body of work in the, uh, for a Michael Guerin, isn't mm. That's a great statement of yours normally, body of work. You like saying that, don't you? Yeah, I like, I like saying about lo lots of, of silly stuff. Yeah. Anyway, he hasn't got the body of work at open class level, but he's clearly there. No doubt. Oh, that's his time's No doubt. Right but Phil said, I could not be happier with my horse. I, and I know people think he's only a short course horse, but you've got to remember, he placed in the Dominion, placed in the Inter-Dominion final. He's not a forlorn hope to well, win a, the race. A lot of it comes down to what John Dunn lets him do. If Majestic Man just rolls around for two laps doing nothing... As we saw King of Swing doing the Blacks of Fake at Albion Park a couple of weeks ago, he turned a distance race into a sprint race. Yes. He just went slow early and then kept going faster. If Majestic Man can do that, he can get away with this, but I just don't think John will let him do that. I'm pretty confident John will outstay him over 2,700 metres with Sunday Sun. What I'm not confident of is where that puts bolt, bolt for, for brilliance. brilliance. The one niggly part is, and we saw this at Cambridge, if one horse, that's a problem with speed maps, if one horse gets in between them, yep. Bolt for Brilliance is four lengths behind the other horse yep. rather than... That's why I think Tony will come out. He can't afford to let that happen. Yeah. Going, to be, going to be a great race. It's a shame there's not more horses in it, but often we see with small races they can be very compelling. So, ironically, if you're having a bet on this race and you're watching this at home and you're having a multi-bet, because I think Beyond Words earlier in the programme we'll talk about shortly is the most ridiculous stuff I've ever seen. $1.35. I, I thought that yeah. opened a eight. It's dollar thirty-five. If you're looking for a multi, the easiest multi in the race is this. Majestic Man top three. Yep. He's going to run top three. He's yes. going to lead. You saw the gap in the Lyle Creek Stakes. They put 50 metres on those horses. And that was over 2,200. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so he'll run top three, and that you can run that through your multis because yep. there's a minuscule chance Sunday Sun will gallop. And there's a little chance Bolt for Brilliance will gallop. There's no chance Majestic Man will gallop. He'll no. just go straight to the front. Yep. So that's where you run that through. If you feel like having a silly multi into the gallops and into everything else, that might be the interest adder out of the race. All right, let's move on to another of the Group 1s. 30th running of the Dunstan Horse Feeds Sire Stakes. We're better twists. Speaking of multis, we'll be through many, $1.40. La Rosa went very close to beating her last time. She's come up with a 550 price. Uh, next best was Darling Me at $7. And off the second row, Brave You Kelly. I believe she's got a good place chance in this. The second of the Mark Jones runners, the other being La Rosa. But here was that performance I was talking about. La Rosa in front here. First go, Alexandra Park. Very brave, but not as brave as Better Twist. The Woodland Stud Caduceus Club Phillies Classic at Group 1 level. Michael went to the best filly in the land. Yeah, she's clearly the best. Now, what this doesn't show you is she had a flat tyre for the last mile here. Now, that's that's obviously crucial because while she only just got home then, you go, well, hold on, why is she $1.40? She had a flat tyre, and she's very unlikely to have a flat tyre on Thursday night. I also can't be copying $1.40 for her because La Rosa is going to lead. I spoke to Mark Jones. He said his driving instructions to Sam, oh, it will be exactly the same. We're not going there to run second, we're going to have a crack, and we'll find out. So they're going to stay in front, which means best case scenario, better twist is parked or 1-1. One, one. Well, it's hard to do that and win Group 1's $1.40. Yes, she's better, yes, she'll probably win. She's about a $1.70 chance in my head. That's not because I disrespect her talent levels, Gregory. It's because she's going to have to win this race an awfully hard way. So I think she'll win. $1.40 is too short for me for a horse who's not going to be leading. And Mark was very explicit. I am absolutely going to tell Sam 
we lead, that's what the owners want, will be staying there. All right, well, we know exactly where she'll be there, but I do like Brave View Kelly for a place. Again, I know you're only probably battling for one spot with Darling Me, but what, she's what, got what, high speed. What odds is she applying? She's 260, 270. Okay, so what you're saying in this yep. little punter tutorial yep. we're here is we think La Rosa's going to run one or two, and we think Better Twist is going to run one or so two. So you really play. So if you took those two out of the field, yep. would you back Brave View Kelly to win at 260 against Darling Me? Yes. And enjoy, yes, me, would. And enjoy me in the trail? Mm. So then good you say to yourself, good more, good point, you say to yourself, there's one spot left, we believe, there's one spot left for me to get a dividend out of. Mm. Enjoy me in the trail, getting a lot easier run, covering four less lengths, yep. versus darling me, who's probably applicable horse, maybe slightly inferior to, to Brave And then Kelly. I'm saying Brave You Kelly will be Would there, I take right? 260 about that if she has to come three or four wide? So that's where you find yourself trying to work out whether you think that's value. I'm not arguing yeah, with you at all. Yep. I'm just saying yep. the numbers tell I, the story. I agree. Yep. Yeah. But I'm, hap I'm happy because I, I really like Brave View Kelly. I think she's got explosive speed and maybe she can use that to find a spot. New Zealand Bloodstock, Standard Bread, Harness Million of the Sale Series race that's been run since the early 90s. First class, inside draw, 850. Pace and pride. I think first class holds the key to this race, by the way. I'll tell you what in a minute. $5. Uh, further down, the All Stars have Aladdin at 9.53. American Dealer, who was awesome last time. We'll look at that in a moment. And Shan Noble, who's drifted out, $4. BD Joe, $7.50. So let's have a look at BD Joe winning on Christmas Eve. Tipped out on the show by Michael Guerin. In front round, Cambridge was always going to be extremely hard. Most amazing thing about this was he paid $2.80. I thought he'd start $1.80. Um, he actually worked quite hard to get to the front. The first 600 was very quick here. And he's beating a, a serious middle grade horse outside him, Italian lad. He's really been beat up by the draw. Second line Killed barrier by, draw. He, really? Absolutely hurts him. He can still win, but like American Dealer, he's going to have to find a different way to win. We know American Dealer can come from back in the field to win. We saw that in the Alabar Classic. We don't know this horse can do it. I'm not saying he can't, but we're going to need to see something new from him. He actually hasn't had many bad barrier draws in his life. He's got a bad day to get one. Yep. Well, the horse that I think is the key to the race's first class because Shan Noble follows it out. Let's go back to that Alabar Classic. Uh, American mm. Dealer was outstanding. Ray Green's told us a few times that he's never gone a bad race yet. He was excellent in this. He really finds the line. Shan Noble had sat park. He'd moved around on a very good speed. The other horse you need to look for here is Luke John because he's charging home. That's runner number six in this race. He picks up pace, pace and pride and beats him for third. So he was charging at the line. But the reason I think Shan Noble, the barrier draw might not be that bad for him, is first class, if, if he decides to get off the gate like he did as a two-year-old, can get off very quickly. There may well be room early for Shan Noble to get off. I think pace and pride will come out as hard. If he can get off and potentially roll around and you think the front would be there for Shan Noble, you know full well it would be. If he got the front and got there in front of American Dealer, he can beat him. Yeah, I agree that the one holds the key for the nine, but what bothers me is the three. Mr. Fantastic, I think he'll cross the one. Okay. And particularly because First Class had a bad experience last time he tried to go there from the same barrier. Yes. I agree with everything you're saying, and ironically, if First Class got there, there's not a horse you would hand to. Yep. So there's a very good chance that Shen Noble could get the trail. If he did that, I think he would win. But I, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think what about Mr. American Dealer? I think Where, where's Fantastic, he in your life? I, I don't think they want to blast off the gate with American Dealer unless, and David Butcher, in my mind, is the best form judge in the North Island. Yep. Unless he thinks he can keep rolling forward and that Mr Fantastic will get there and it would hand up to him. Yep. Really tricky race. Tricky race, tricky stuff. A lot of driver intent is going to be crucial here. The bottom line is when it all comes down to it, though, American Dealer and Shan Noble at the moment are the best two at yep. the way they're racing. That's yes. because BD Joe's got a bad draw. You can back them both. Yep. You can spend 60% of your spend on American Dealer, 40% on Shan Noble. And win. And give yourself a chance. But yep. I'm not saying it's that clear cut, but that probably comes back at about an 80% winning chance because everything else in the race outside BD Joe, who's got that bad draw, is going to need to do something better than we've seen from it to win. Yep. But I do think Mr Fantastic First Class Early Doors is really interesting. Yep. And if they want to get that involved and they really hum, then American Dealer, the race gets made for him. So mm. I think it's an intriguing race. I actually don't like the race to bet into myself, but well done to New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread. They've put a lot of money into the industry. 
Um, they're making this work. The sales are a big deal for them. They're really, really trying to do the right thing by people. And the fact we still have this race going for 200k when they had no obligation, Greg, to run it for 200k uh, is another win at a 2020. Yeah, definitely. One of the races of the day on the undercard is no doubt race number six. This has only a small field, Michael, but I think there's at least three horses here. Or oh, this horse dance time's already gone round at Free For All Company, but and so is Christians Have Time for that matter, but Typo, Kango and Christians Have Time would be no surprise to see them in the Cup next year. Yeah, they're open class horses. Um, well done to Anna Donnelly. She's been one of the champions of 2020 because she's really emerged. Um, she has two horses here. You can see Kango in front holding off Typo. This is a race about a month ago. Now, Kango subsequently went to a standing start race and blew it. But you see here, they're good horses. And they're good horses who are going to head to open class. I think there might be different tactics this week. Kango led on that occasion, Typo trailed. Do you reckon there's a chance Typo might hold? I think he'll park him. I really do, because he was excellent winning next time. Beat Brave U Kelly, and you heard what I think of her, so uh, beat him up. I beat her up, rather, first up at the park. So if Typo's in front, he'll take all sorts of beating. Uh, Christians have time as the other video we want to have a look at, Michael, because I know you think he's an open-class horse, and he had to be to win, uh, win this. He beat Tommy Lincoln, who subsequently came out and won, and on the cards, who we know has been in an Inter-Dominion final. Yeah, the problem for him is he doesn't have any gate speed, so he has to be neutral at the start, and therefore the Donnelly horses have the chance to get in front of him and therefore not do him any favours. So, yes, he can win if he's good tempo. I don't see there being great tempo unless dance time gets involved. So they go the first 600, 41 and change, yep, he's in play. They go at 43, he's in a world of pain. All right, that's a preview of Alexandra Park and uh, there's a whole lot of other really strong races on the undercard. Go to tab.co.nz and get involved in those. Short break for us when we come back, we'll have a look at some of the other stuff that's been happening around this great nation of ours. He says go, he went bang at the 100. Self-assured, the son of Venice, the light gets away from the fixture in Triple Eight. Self-assured for the 2019 Auckland Cup, and he's done it very comfortably. Second loss of the second. Self-assured, too good last year. We won't see him in this year's Cup, but we will see him at Cambridge in about 10 days' time. Looking forward to seeing him there. Right, let's review some of the country Cups that have been happening in the South. Uh, just prior to Christmas, we had the Ashburton Cup. Great supporters of our show, of course, the Ashburton Raceway. That's Tango Tower in front here, Michael. Franco Niven to his outside, and Steal the Show got through on the inside. And about here, you thought, ah, oh, yeah, Steal the Show's going to beat him, but... He's a very good sayer, Tango Tara. I was so pleased for Jim Curtin. Uh, he didn't get things go his way for the New Zealand Cup, but uh, have a look at him here. He's clearly got headed by two horses, has kicked back through the middle. They went about 4-1, and he outstayed them, and uh, Russell Nepea has been a great supporter of that stable, the Jim and Sandy Curtin barn. Yep, good addition to races like the Easter Cup, next year's New Zealand Cup. I, I think a good, hard year of racing at this level. Getting a few bumps and bruises will be good for him. I, I think he's a horse who could get a night. He, he can win a Kaikoura Cup or something along the way. Um, well done to Ash Burton for having a good stake for their cup and, and let's hope we find a better date for the race. Yep, and steal the show. We mentioned that last week. There's Curdy, who's pretty rap, letting uh, Gavin Smith know that, yep, I knew I had you covered even though you got past me. And He's a good stayer and uh, I'm sure he'll win his share. There's AJ Berry taking the photo as well. He ran second in the race we're about to show you uh, last year, Tango Tara, the Westport Cup. So let's uh, head on uh, to that and go across the Alps and have a look at the Westport Cup of 2020. What a great uh, circuit it is, Greg. It's just an amazing circuit. I'll be honest, I thought Belmont Major was home here. He's the horse in front and... Look, he looked to be home and... It's Jim Curtin again. Exactly. Here's Cruiser. Now, Michael House just seems to be turning up all over the shop with these horses. They went 4-1 in the Ashburton Cup. They went 4-21 here in the Westport Cup. Not that that's relevant to the connections of uh, Cruiser, but uh, a couple of cups in a few days for Jim Curtin. He's uh, a regular, of course, 
on the West Coast. And I think Cruiser had had one previous start there for one win, so he's unbeaten on the surface there. And yeah, it was a really good staying performance uh, from uh, him. He didn't start the second day. Uh, Belmont Major did, and unfortunately for the Tom Baggery trained runner, he had to succumb again. This time to a horse that, well, he's often gone good races, but never really gets to the markers too often. He did this time, Finn Frost, and he was able to outstay him. I, I thought he was home here, Belmont Major. Um, Finn Frost has, has fought back. I've got a special mention for a horse in this race. There's only a nose margin there. Special mention. Johnny Ear. He went around again. Johnny Ear went around again. Now, he's not going to win another Country Cup, probably. I think this was about his 23rd or 24th start at Westport. Correct. Now, they only race at Westport two days a year for this one and maybe two in February sometimes. So that's four times a year. Imagine having 24 starts at Westport. Horses like him who turn up, they try, they're good manners, they're lovely standard bred horses. Those horses make New Zealand racing great at these Country Cup level, Greg. So to Johnny Ear, I know you didn't win, and my apologies to the connections of the horse who did win, but he deserves a special mention, Greg, because there's a little bit of Johnny Ear in all of us. Yeah, there is, and I don't think Kyle Cameron will be too worried about us giving him a decent mention there, but well done to Kyle too. Uh, the Cameron family have been winning races over there for a long time. Gore Pacing Cup. Well, the performance uh, here was from Stand Out. John Morrison trains and drives. It was win number four for him. Uh, he won at Geraldine, and he picked them up here and won really nicely. So congratulations to John. We know his exploits in the driving ranks, and as a junior driver, he's a couple of times premiership winner. Uh, he's doing a good job training them as well, Michael. Yeah, likeable young fella. You can tell he's going to make it in both aspects of the game. I'm not sure if you watched a lot of Gore, but man, there were some big margins. Yeah, the track was quite soft, and again, the time they went in this was uh, 214 mile rate, so that tells you that it was hard going, but uh, he just outstayed them again, so uh, well done to, to John. Finished third on Cup Day behind Revered, this horse, and I suppose that Cup Day form, uh, we should have respected it a bit more because he's gone, as I said, to win at Geraldine and now win the Gore Cup. They had a Trotting Cup as well, which was a pretty special win for the Bond family. Lyndon trained this one. I was talking to Blair Orange about Tweedledee, and I said, oh, when did you get on him? He said, actually... Uh, Lyndon rang me a couple of weeks ago and said would I be able to drive and he said I'm not really sure he said it's the race I really want to win Lyndon the son of course of Jimmy Bond who will get a shot of shortly a, uh, a name associated with Southern Harness Racing for a very long time so it, it just shows you Michael winning races sometimes there are more reasons to win them and, and, and bigger things than just stake money well, I totally agree. I, I would love to win a race at a moto my home track down home I'd love to win the Westport Cup as much as I would love to win a good race at Alexandra Park. It's amazing how you have emotional ties to different races, and, and if you can pull them off, it, it feels like you've won something special. So um, if you're going to try and do that, get Blair Orange to drive your horse. He has been so in the zone for such a long time now, Blair. It's quite remarkable. What's also remarkable is the length of this. Jimmy going to the horse's head there. He's got the cup in his hand, and yeah, well done to them. They're, they're absolutely delighted to win that race. But when you consider, and, and Dexter did this a few times as well, but Blair's doing it and travelling as far as anybody I know. So you go Westport to Gore. I know he drove back to Christchurch and then flew to Gore. Then back over to Westport, then back again. We're talking about four, four and a half hours in the how, car. How do you fly to Gore? From Christchurch. To Invercargill. So you fly to Invercargill and then yeah. drive to Gore, which is about an hour I'm learning from memory. I'm learning. Um, and then back to Reefton, then back back home, then up to Auckland. Yeah, I, I know it's their job, Michael, but that is a heck of a oh, lot of travel. Guess. Lots of people have jobs that don't work seven days a week. Mm. Um, the other thing too is Justin Evans. Now, a, a lot of people say to me about trackside and the way it's changed over the last year. There's a couple of people I say, well, one person's really stood out to me as embellishing their career, under difficult circumstances, of course, because there's no on-track presenters. Uh, Justin Evans has, has come on in leaps and bounds. He's travelled to every meeting you can think about in both codes so far. He's got a lot more to come up. He calls well. Um, he doesn't pretend he knows things he doesn't know. Uh, I think he's calling nine days in a row. On, 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 on very hard <laughs> Try on doing that. I'm very hard on presenters and commentators because they, they have to act to a certain standard. Oh, I know that, Michael. It's a difficult job. You, you deserve a slap around the head <laughs> sometimes. But Justin Evans has been one of the fines of... New I've never met him. I'm not mates. So I don't know him at all. He's been one of the fines of New Zealand racing in 2020. Justin, you can be well proud of what you've achieved, mate.
Yep, well said, uh, Michael. We'll uh, go now to one of the races he called the Christmas Cup at uh, Monte Carrara with Paul Rimwick Kitchen Joinery. And uh, this was a cracking finish, and he got it bang on. So much so, Michael, I think we'll get Justin to bring them home. Really quickly, Gilligan's Island in the blink of an eye went to the lead for Got You Covered. Laser bo Labor Boxing on for the bike. Cheezel is trying to get home well. Gilligan's Island got you covered. Cheezel's arrived to be the last little bit. Labor not done with. It's Gilligan's Island. Got you covered. Cheezel the outside. Labor the inside. They come to the line. It's going to be close. It's going to be really close. And I'm not sure at the line. I wouldn't split. Well, he wasn't sure. The judge was. Couldn't be split. Got you covered in Gilligan's Island, who's become a bit of a Country Cups uh, specialist. Look at the crowd there, Michael. The Mata Carrara racetrack there, about oh, 25 minutes to Akarara and about 25 minutes back to Christchurch, was packed to the gunnels. You can talk to your blue in the face. You can show me every spreadsheet on earth. Nobody is going to convince me closing down regional racetracks en masse is a good idea. Nobody. Because the people who watch those races at Mata Carrara, the people who watch those races at Gore, maybe one day are going to go to the sales and they're going to buy a horse or they're going to get a job in racing or they're going to take a job at doing... You know how I know that? Because I, went to, I was in Greymouth and when I grew up at Victoria Park, that's what's made me spend a million dollars. I'll spend a million dollars on racehorses. Oh, and, and that's what... <laughs> no, but, but also, your love of racing has made you get involved in having farms and adjustment properties and administrators and commentators. Some of the most significant people in the history of the racing of this country grew up in small towns. Mm. Now, yes, we can't have as many tracks as we have, yep. but if you have these small tracks, for a start, give them good dates. Yep. Let them all race in summer when the people are in these regions and they want to come. Don't give them shit dates in the middle of June and July. Nobody can convince me that taking these away, because what will happen if we take all this to the country tracks, no one wants to go to Addington on a Thursday afternoon in summer. Nobody wants to go to Alexandra Park in January. Hmm. If this happens, if we are stupid enough to do this in this country, what will happen is we'll all be sitting in a meeting in 10 years' time and some genius in marketing will say, we need to reconnect with the regions and we'll roll out some $10 million plan to reconnect with the regions. <laughs> We've seen it before. Was, you try telling me those people went to Botacarara would have gone to that same meeting at Addington. Absolute bullshit they would yep, have. No chance. And anybody who tries to tell you that doesn't understand the country they're living in. Well said, Michael. Gregor, Very good. Gre that was oh, our political I'm, I'm serious, Gregory, because Michael I think Gregor. about it so much. Yep, I know, I know. And you lose those people from the regions. When they moved to Auckland, I haven't lived in Greymouth for 30 years, but my love of racing came from Greymouth. Yes. And when you take, for example, something we know better, cricket. You take cricket away from a town like Greymouth, people there care less about it because they don't play it when they're kids. You take rugby. Take, for example, league. A lot of places in this country don't have rugby league in their hometowns. And people don't get that bond with it they get with the All Blacks because everybody has rugby in their hometown. Mm. No one can convince me this is a good idea. There's got to be a better way than mass closures. Let's give these smaller tracks lesser class racing and the opportunity to race in summer when people are there. Yep, totally agree with that, Michael. Short break for us, then we'll be in our home straight in your box seat. The build-up towards Auckland Cup night. Seat about to be wrapped up for 2020 as we go back and have a look at the bookies and what's been happening with them over the last week or so. And a big thank you to Matt Peden and the whole bookmaking team. They've been great over the last uh, 15 shows that we've had. Uh, here's some of the hits, Michael. Terra Maria, decent bet there at Westport in race 10, three and a half thousand at dollar seventy-five. Last would Louis hurt the punters more than once, Michael. 20k at 460. Uh, I think he finished third from memory. Still, the show was well back uh, to win the cup, and that uh, came unstuck as well. And Taz Girl Bromac in race number one, eight and a half thousand, a dollar seventy-five. Then came out and won the second day. So, well, mm -hmm. worse than that, Taz Girl Bromac. Someone said eight and a half thousand. It's got the lead around Westboard. Yeah, it's been beaten by a ten-year-old maiden on debut. Race by John Rogers. If you go back over the, locals. the over the hundred and 30 years since they ran the first Auckland Cup. We'll call that the start of harvest racing. Yep, 1890. 1890. Commodore yep. one. 
10-year-old maidens who went on debut, there might be 10. Yep. There might be 10 in over a century, and if you're back Tasman Bromac, one of them's come and beaten you. I hope your cat is hiding somewhere <laughs> when, that, when that moment happened in your life. I watched it the other day and thought, well... That'll I, do me. I wouldn't have seen that in 30 years since I've been doing this. Yep. It might have happened back in the day. Ten-year-old maidens would have gone debut, betting $1.85. I, I shouldn't laugh. No. That's brutal. It's not funny. It's not funny. <laughs> it's, it's not funny. Well, right, what's ahead for us? We've got plenty happening around this great nation. And, of course, Alexandra Park, a couple of $200,000 races. We've got three Group 1s. The Sims Pacific Medals National Trot's going to be a race that so many people are going to want to watch at 20 minutes to 8 o'clock. And we've got a $50,000 guaranteed pick of the sixer. First race there, 353. So plenty of time to get everything done you need to during the day and then settle in for that as we turn the page on 2020. Winton, one o'clock start there, nine races uh, to complement that. Then we've got Omakau and uh, we have the big uh, free for all there where Stylish Memphis will be looking to wind the clock back 12 months for Ricky May and a much better result, let's hope so. For the Mark Jones trained at Mayor, it's a good field for that though. Uh, the Wellington Cup, $10,000 there. Tohara Nikau, the five races they have there on Saturday. 11.05 the first of those. Harangi Ora have a 10 race program, seven minutes past one there on Sunday. Gee, it's hard to work out what date matches up with what day at this time of the year, isn't it? Monday, Roxburgh Cup, 15000 there. They'll have a big crowd, 11 races, 1.40 the start time for that one. Otaki. The Cup, $12,000 there, also on Monday. They've only got the four races, but that complements the thoroughbreds, of course. 11.15, the start time there. And then Cromwell on the Wednesday, 12.17, the 11th races there. And that is on the 6th of January. Best bets, the run for Michael Guerin continued. Let's see if it can this week too. And do you think Spankham? I think Typo. I think it's a pretty good multi. I, I, I've struggled to find a bit of the week because Sunday sun was really short. Beyond words, or when it's a dollar thirty-five, and I don't want to be tipping those to and people. And better twist, dollar forty. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't want to be tipping those to people. I think Spankham's a really good bet. Everything suggests to me it'll win, and if it does win, it's Mark and Natalie's last race. Wouldn't that be quite poetic? Hmm. Quite a way to go out. Typo's really interesting. Well found by you. It's four forty to three ninety. I reckon it'll start two fifty. Yeah, I agree. I reckon all the money will come for Typo. Yep, and I spoke to Todd Mitchell when he gave me. Pretty good push that he might stay in front this week, and if that happens, yep, he's definitely the one to beat. January's a big month in the harness racing, so we've summarised things for you. Cambridge Flying Mile Night, self assured to be there. Uh, 8th of January is the date for that. And I also spoke to Phil Williamson. There's a chance Majestic Man might yeah. go there for the a 1700. And copy that might go there too. Okay, yeah. cool. And then things are still up in the air with all that uh, Australia. Uh, the raid of the Kiwis, if you like. Nelson have their two days. Blenheim have theirs. Alexandra Park and Addington return on the 22nd. It's the Garrard's Premier Mayor's Championship at Addington on the 29th. And, Michael, we're basically off air. Well, not basically. We are off air for the entire month of January. And we're back on the 3rd of February, which is an incredibly important time because we have two shows to build towards the New Zealand bloodstock sales. 13th and 14th at Karaka and the 15th through 17th Canterbury Agricultural Park. Uh, it's often described as the barometer for where the industry's at and this year it's going to be enormously significant from a point of view that so many of the buyers will be coming from Australia via the internet. Yep, it worked really well for previous sales, whether it was the weanling sale back in May, the ready to unsale for the gallopers. Uh, back in November. It's, it's an incredibly interesting time ahead, whether our horses go to Australia or not, whether Mark Purden goes with them, which he's intending to do. Majestic Man could well go. That first show back on February the 3rd, two days later is the Great Southern Star. Majestic Man could be there on a Friday night. Saturday could see Spankham and Self Assured. So a lot happening here. Um, if you're going to miss your harness racing fix from the show, and we're glad you've watched over 2020. This man put the show together. I wasn't responsible for that. Greg put the show together off his bat, found all the sponsors. Without the sponsors, we couldn't do it. But this has nothing to do with me, Gregory. So congratulations for getting the show back. If you're going to miss the show, um, Harness Racing New Zealand will have previews every day. So there'll be previews every day on the website, some video previews and lots of content from, from Johnny and Josh and myself and, and Craig and all sorts of people. So um, if you're missing your fix, that might be the place to find it. Michael, what's the one thing you're looking forward to the most in 2021? I'm looking forward to travelling again. I'm looking forward to getting overseas at some stage. But from a racing point of view, I'm looking forward to not using COVID as an excuse. 
I, I don't want to hear, well, we can't do this because of COVID, or we can't do that because of COVID, or we've had to cut this expense because of COVID. Yes, we've had to cut our cloth, but let's stop making excuses. Let's make a good product. Because the customers who watch this show can also go to the casino, they can also go to Eden Park, they can also go to the movies, they can also go out for dinner. So they want a good customer experience, Gregory. And one thing I've learned from a long time at the, a lot of sports and racing, the customer experience is king. Racing can't forget that. So that's what, we, that's what I want to see in 2021. I'm looking forward to, hopefully, our horses, New Zealand, taking on Australia and finally deciding who's the best at the moment because that is something I'd really look forward to. Before I thank the sponsors, happy birthday, mate. Good of you to come on on your birthday. <laughs> I, tell you, I tell you what, if somebody had said to me, you can do any one thing for your birthday, this is the thing I would have wanted to do. Come on, back on the show that you made happen again to preview a great race day at Alexandra Park. Mate, that's a birthday gift to me, mate. So thank you for organising it. All right, no, thank you, Michael. And a big thank you to our stable of sponsors. Uh, Woodlands, New Zealand Bloodstock, Standard Bed, Brickens, uh, Harness Racing New Zealand, who have been great in helping us put this together. IRT, our, your horse, our passion, as we know. Stonewall Stud and Stables, great supporters as well. Garrard's from across the Tasman. The clubs, Addington, Alexandra Park, Cambridge and Ashburton. And of course, Door Contracting, who have got in behind our best bets of the week. That's been your box seat for 2020. We'll see you at the start of February.